wanted to talk about light beyond illumination. I want to talk about light as a carrier for information. And so when I usually think about light as a carrier for information, the first thing I think about is fiber optics. So some of you may have seen uh, fiber optic cables. This is the carrier for phone conversations for the internet. Uh, fibers are typically glass. Um, they could be plastic. Uh, and light is trapped inside. And light is the carrier of information that you take from one end of the fiber to the other. So has, has everybody seen a fiber optic cable? Most people, no, some people know. So I, I did bring a, a piece of fiber with me. And this is um, fiber that is not cladded with a, a big polymer buffer cladding. So you can probably not really even uh, see it here, but I'll pass it around. It's about the thickness of a human hair. Uh, it consists of two parts. Uh, there's one called the core in the middle. That's where light's trapped. And then there's a cladding uh, around the outside. Both are thin uh, glass. And the cladding ensures that the light stays trapped in the inside. So again, information is going to be contained within the light signal. And this fiber allows you to guide where you want to put the light signal. So I'll just go ahead uh, and pass this around. OK, so what I'm going to talk about um, initially is the, the fiber and how this transmits information. So how can we go from light signals to things like ones and zeros? And how can that encode things like my voice, text, data, et cetera? Once we understand the fundamentals, I'm then going to go into the more research topics and things that we actually study here at Vanderbilt. Uh, the two topics I wanted to address today are, first, uh, computers. Right now, if you open up your computer, you see only electronics. Uh, what I hope to see in the future is electronics merged with optics. So if you introduce light into your computers, it has the potential to operate much faster and with lower power. So we'll talk about that. And the second topic I want to talk about is uh, chemical and biomolecular sensors. So it turns out that light can also help you do early disease diagnosis. It can help you tell if you potentially have um, environmental hazards, uh, if your water is contaminated, if your hamburgers that you might enjoy this weekend for festivities have E. coli or not. Light can actually contain that kind of information too. So we'll talk about how light can contain information both in computing as well as in sensing applications. So first we'll talk about the fundamentals with fiber optics. And the example I want to start with is a simple one. So let's assume we're here in the US. Uh, not quite in Tennessee, but close enough. Uh, and we want to have a conversation with somebody in Europe. How do we do that? Well, we can pick up the phone, or we can use our internet. And the information, our voice, or our text messages, will eventually go into a fiber optic cable that's laid under the ocean. And so light is going to be the carrier of this information. So there's a couple of things we have to figure out. The first one is, how can our voice and our text data actually get transferred into a light signal and how does that propagate uh, across the ocean? So we'll keep our broad picture in mind uh, and study uh, some basic encoding. Our voice, if we represent it as a signal, uh, might look something like I've shown here. This is the word hello. You think hello is pretty simple, but actually as a signal, it looks a little bit complex. When I say hello, I have different frequencies in my voice, different tones, as well as different volumes. So you see that there's different amplitudes in the signal, and there's different frequencies in the signal. And so we need to figure out how to encode this into the ones and zeros that we're going to send as light down our fiber optic cables. So unfortunately, hello is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to take a slightly simpler example, but still an analog signal that could re represent some sort of a tone. And how we break that up is to do something called sampling. And what sampling does is at a particular uh, interval in time, we're going to go and check what the amplitude of our signal is. So at the first point, we have a 7. At the second point in time, we're here at an 8, then a 9, and so forth. And so we can begin to break up our signal into digital representations. This is not quite ones and zeros yet, but we're getting there. What you'll notice is, depending on how finely we sample our analog signal, will depend on the fidelity of the sound and the information. So what we really want to do is have a finer sampling to more accurately represent our initial signal. And so here, we've now divided it up into uh, amplitudes from 0 to 18, and we've taken much finer intervals of sampling. But we're still left with the problem of we've gone from our, our crazy analog signal here to something that's numbers, but we still need to get to our ones and zeros. And fundamentally, with light, you can think of 1, light is on, 0, light is off. So fortunately, there's a lot of different kinds of encoding that we can use. A very simple one is called binary encoding. So what I have here is an example of counting from 0 to 19. 
and the top traditionally as we would, and on the bottom is counting in binary. So in counting in binary, you have 0, 1, but then a 2 is represented as a 1, 0, 3 is 1, 1, 4 is a 1, 0, 0, and so forth. So this is how we can fundamentally change our numeric into ones and zeros. If we then think about something like typing on the keyboard, there's 127 keys on our keyboard. ASCII is one way of encoding all of those into numbers. And so, for example, if we want to encode a capital A, uh, ASCII will tell us that's number 65. And then from 65, we can go back to binary and encode that into ones and zeros. So hopefully this gives you some basic idea of how you can go from voice or text into ones and zeros. And light, again, ones are light on, zeros light off. So this hopefully gives you some motivation of how we can use light to convey information. If you're still confused, I brought some demonstrations. Fortunately, light is very visual, so it, it lends itself very well to demonstrations. So the first one uh, that I thought I'd do is to shine light through a fiber. Uh, let me put on our display here. There we go. Okay, so what I've brought along here is uh, a fiber bundle. The fiber that's circulating around the room is called a single mode optical fiber. It's very thin. It has very low losses. So that's the kind of fiber that you would have for long distance propagation where you don't want to uh, lose your signal intensity. This is for short distance propagation. It works well for demonstrations. It's a several fibers. If you want to take a look at it afterwards, you're welcome to. And I'm going to just show you uh, with hopefully the help of a volunteer because I don't have enough hands. I have a green laser pointer here. Uh, and we're gonna shine it in one side of the fiber and we're gonna watch it come at the other side of the fiber. And it shouldn't matter how we twist and turn the fiber, the light should stay inside the fiber. So a volunteer, an extra set of hands to help. Don't be shy. Okay, great. I know, we should be able to see this, I think. Okay, so we've got, um, paper that we'll try to reflect the signal off of. So I'll just prop that up here. And you have the choice of doing the coupling of the light into the fiber or choosing the direction of the fiber and maintaining the output. I'm gonna choose the direction. All right. So I will shine the light in the input. Actually, I'll, I'll switch with you. I'll take this side and take this one. And I'll shine it in the input. And are we getting anything on the output? Yeah, it's very thin. Bring it closer. There we go. Can people see that? So the fiber is different than the laser. The laser light is highly directional and focused. Uh, the fiber is divergent. And so light, as soon as it comes out of the fiber, starts to diverge and get broader, which is why uh, we have to put it fairly close to the piece of paper to be able to see it. Um, so usually on the output end of your information signal, you would have additional optics to focus the light and direct it into your electronics and change it back into an electrical signal. So it doesn't matter which way we bend and move the light, it stays uh, trapped inside the fiber. And we're trying to bend it severely here, and we still can't stop the light. So thank you very much for your help. And this is also available for playing with uh, after we finish here today. Okay. So that hopefully gives you some semblance of an idea of how light can stay trapped in a fiber. But you might still be confused about how can we get information into that fiber. So, uh, trying to help you there too. And first we'll start by removing the fiber, but just dealing with the encoding of information into light. And so what I have here is a setup where this is a laser. Uh, I have it hooked up to my information source, which is my iPod. And at the other end is a detector where it's gonna capture the light signal and send it to a speaker. And hopefully we'll be able to hear at the output what I'm sending in the input. So let me turn our speaker on. Make sure our laser's on, get it lined up, and I'll get my music going. I picked something that I think should be appropriate. Does this sound familiar? And so, in fact, it's sending on the laser light, so if I block the laser light, I've blocked the information. The laser is containing the music. I let it go again, and the music continues. Do we have anybody with musical inclination in the audience? No, you're prob they're probably all listening to the other faculty seminar. Anybody who wanted to be a musician? I have a, I have a job for you. Okay. The old DJs with the records 
we, we have our version of it. You can have the frequency comb and please entertain us. <laughs> Done like a true engineer, actually. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so hopefully now you have a better concept of going from information to light, and then we can recover it again. I have one more demonstration. Again, looking for people who are uh, musically inclined. If you didn't buy that one, I've got one more. And this one is, uh, we have here a music app uh, on my graduate student Gilbert's iPad. So now the input to our laser is this piano. So who here wants to entertain us on the piano? This is exactly how it is in the classroom when you ask a question sometimes. But the key is to be patient, and eventually somebody caves. Ah, excellent. OK, so everybody's going to be watching. So there's no magic here. I'm not involved. As we touch the piano and he plays the sound, it's going over the laser. demo session is over for now. We'll have part two coming later. Uh, but hopefully this, this does give you a, a visual um, and an intuitive impression as to how light can carry information. Okay. okay, so the first topic I want to address is computers. So how can we use light to make our computers operate faster and with lower power? And so the what I have here is light is going to be carried down waveguides instead of electricity um, carrying information down copper wires. So waveguides are very similar to the fiber optics that we just talked about. So the fiber bundle I showed you, the fiber that was circulating around the room. But instead of having a circular symmetry of our fiber, and the size is, as you saw, about the thickness of a human hair, about a tenth of a millimeter, we're going to put something on a silicon wafer. And silicon, of course, is the material that your cell phones, computers, et cetera, technology is made of. Our waveguide here has a rectangular cross-section, and the height of the waveguide is about 1,000 times smaller than that fiber that was just passed around. So it would do me no good to pass around a waveguide because you wouldn't be able to see it. OK, and again, the motivation for integrating light into your computers is not to add complexity. It really has a purpose, and that purpose is to try to make your computers run faster and with lower power. The other advantage that light affords you is that with computers, if you have a data stream traveling down a wire, a copper wire, you can only have one data stream going at a time. If you try to send two data streams at the same time, they interfere with each other, and you won't be able to resolve those two individual data streams at the end. With light, on the other hand, and here I'm giving an example back with the fiber, but it works exactly the same way with the waveguide, you can have multiple different signals. And here I'm representing each signal as a different color of light. So if you imagine the phone analogy again, you can have four different phone conversations from four different houses that you want to be talking to somebody on the other side of the country or the other side of the world. And these are all going to be combined on the same fiber optic cable. So this could be the same cable that's running under the ocean. And all these different conversations are loaded onto the same cable. And at the end, you can easily separate them again. There's no interference. Because they're each operating at a different color, they don't interfere with each other. So that's another advantage of um, your optical. Here's the motivation for why we should be concerned about our current level of computing with electronics. So this is a, a bit of a complicated graph, but I'll walk you through it. The green line here shows us uh, over time, that's the x-axis here, the number of transistors in the computer is increasing steadily. Transistors are really the brains of the computer. They're the ones that encode your information uh, and, and make the performance of the computer what it is. So the more transistors you have, the more powerful your computer is. 
The problem that we have is, as you can see, there's a roll off in these other values. So one is the speed of uh, each core in the computer, as well as the performance metrics of the computer. And the problem here is that we've reached a point where we can't squeeze more transistors onto the processor of a computer anymore. So the only solution we have is to add more cores. So now when you buy a computer, it usually has dual core or quad core. Some of them have six or even eight cores. And so the challenge then becomes, as you integrate more cores and have processes that you want to run, it has to be distributed over those cores. So it takes some software engineering, we teach our students how to do this, to separate the different, um, different metrics and uh, agendas onto each of these different cores, and then it has to be recombined together. So the bottleneck becomes in the division of your operation and then bringing them back together again as well as the power consumption. So each core consumes a finite amount of power, but the more cores you put on, the more power you're consuming. And so heat dissipation is an issue, and one of my graduate students pulled this movie, which I think uh, we can all enjoy if it plays properly. Let's see here. So this will illustrate how hot uh, your processor can get in your computer. So that's the processor. A drop of water was put on. It boils immediately, pretty hot. Then uh, this person has the ingenious idea of cooking their lunch on it and puts a piece of meat down. And this is, we've kind of sped up the video a little bit, but you see he flips it over and the meat is cooked. <laughs> so, uh, current, and this is an older technology, so current processors are, are very hot. Uh, they're running very hot. It's a concern. Um, I don't recommend you try this at home if you want to continue using your computer for normal processes afterwards. Okay, so before I tell you how optics can help us solve the problem, I'm going to give you a brief tutorial on how current electronics work. And I mentioned that transistors are really the brains behind the computer. So if you have a, a transistor here, and remember that all of our information can be encoded in ones and zeros, as we talked about before. So if we look at an example, and we have an input that's a zero, and we have a control signal that's a zero, when it goes through the transistor, for particular types of transistors, we might have an output of, for example, another zero. If we have different inputs, here's another example, a 1 and a 0. These are not matched. So if this is an AND, this is still a 0. It's only when we have, for example, two ones that we get an output of 1. So really, this control signal and this input signal together, when you adjust uh, the applied voltages and the applied electricity, can control what your output is. So as you want to encode different ones and zeros, you can change your control signal. And you, it also depends on what your input looks like. On the bottom right here is an electron microscopy image. So electrons are used for looking at very, very small things that you can't see in a normal microscope. Uh, and this is what a transistor looks like. So this scale bar here is 100 nanometers. And we'll talk about this size scale uh, later. But just to give that in perspective, that's about 100,000 times smaller than the fiber optic that was passed around. So it's very, very small. Again, I could pass this around and you can't see it with your eyes. OK, so this is electronics. Now if we look at optics, I've shown a very similar picture. With the optics, uh, we have an input, we're going to have some sort of control, and we're going to have an output. And again, remembering light on is like a 1, light off is like a 0. And this control now can be either light or it could be electricity. So we can have a hybrid of light and electricity. So if we take an example and we have an input of 1, our control is off, then our output is, is 0. If we want to change the 0 to a 1, we can simply control uh, our voltage or our light signal and make this go on, and now we have a 1. So using this external voltage or this external light signal, we can change this between a 1 and a 0 and encode our data. This now is another electron microscope image of an optical switch. So this is the analogy of the transistor and electronics. You'll notice the size scale here is in the micron size scale. So this is at least 10 times bigger than your transistor, so it's a bigger footprint. But again, remember the advantage of having multiple data streams traveling down the same waveguide. And so I'm going to explain. And this is actually a, a research structure that we're doing uh, in my research group here at Vanderbilt. So the structure is called a ring resonator. The straight waveguide here is what we talked about. So this is similar to our fiber optic. And now next to this straight waveguide, I've put a circular waveguide. And so when light travels in our waveguide, it has two paths that it could travel. One is what I call path A. It could just continue traveling straight down the first waveguide. The second option it has is to actually go and circulate in the ring in path B. So if light chooses path A, it reaches the end. There's some light intensity, so that's going to be light on. That's our digital one. 
if it chooses path B and stays circulating in the circular ring here, you'll have darkness at the output, and that's a zero. So if we want to change between ones and zeros, we need to change which path light chooses. So, OK, buckle your seat belts. We're going to learn a little bit about how light chooses uh, which way to go. And so the criterion here, and I will define the terms, is as follows. For light to circulate in the ring, choosing path B, the optical path length must be an integer multiple of the wavelength of light. Got it? Excellent. OK, in case you didn't get it, uh, first let's remind ourselves what wavelength is. Uh, so wavelengths actually could be many things. Anywhere from you can define a wavelength for a radio wave. These are very long waves. Uh, all the way down to ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays, which are very, very short wavelengths. Usually when we talk about wavelengths, we think about this little tiny spectrum in the middle, which is the visible spectrum, and that's light. That's what the part of the spectrum we can see by eye. And so fundamentally, a wavelength looks just like this. It's a wave. A shorter wavelength has a shorter distance between the two adjacent peaks. A longer wavelength has a longer distance between the two adjacent peaks. So if we're talking about the visible spectrum, it turns out that blue light has a shorter wavelength than red light. So when I said that the path length around the ring has to be an integer multiple of the wavelength, what that meant is if you look at this, this wave here and assume that it's traveling around in a circle, if at the beginning of the wave, uh, at the circle, it's at a peak, after it traverses the ring, it had better still be at a peak so it can build on each other. If after it traverses the ring, it's at a valley, you're basically doing an addition of, let's say, 1 plus minus 1 is 0. And so you'd have no light in the ring. Now, the slight complication is I didn't just say path length. I said optical path length. So when I say that, optics means that we have to consider the actual material. What this means is if I have a ring made of glass or a ring made of silicon, the optical path length is actually different. The physical path length might be the same, but because you're traveling in a different material, light actually perceives it as a different length. So here's a simple example. We've set ourselves up a little challenge. So we're going to shine light on two different waveguides. One is based in water. The other is based in air. Air has a refractive index, the material property, equal to 1. Quite literally, what this means is if you shine light through air, it doesn't refract at all. It'll just keep going straight. If you shine light through a glass of water, and perhaps you've done the uh, experiment where you can put a pencil in water and it looks like it's bent, light is refracted in water because it has an index of refraction greater than 1. It's 1.33. OK, so we start the stopwatch. We send light into these two uh, waveguides. Who is the winner? Light coming out of the water or light coming out of the air? The air. Excellent, you're all with me. So we have the race, and indeed, air wins. OK, so moving back to uh, our scientific slide here. We now understand which wavelengths will choose to travel in the ring, those that have the integer multiple of the wavelength, and those that will choose to travel down the waveguide. So the question then becomes, for data encoding, in real time, you need to switch between ones and zeros. And for each data stream, you have one wavelength. So if you have a fixed wavelength, and you're going to assume that this ring size is fixed, we can't change that in real time. The only thing you can change is that refractive index, the material property. So fortunately, for silicon, which is what we're working with, it turns out that if you apply a voltage to the silicon ring, that will change its refractive index. So through the application of voltage, you can switch between path B and path A, or zeros and ones. And people have done this and shown that you can have data rates at about 10 gigahertz to about 40 gigahertz. So you can do pretty fast in data encoding now with light. So this is faster than what we can do with electronics, but not by a significant amount. So here at Vanderbilt, we always try to push the envelope. And what we're doing in my research lab in collaboration with some faculty and students in physics is to try to get to terahertz switching speeds. So we want to go 100 times faster than what I just talked about. And so how do we do that? Silicon by itself is not capable of modulating or encoding data at terahertz speeds. But there are other materials that are capable of doing that. And the material that we're using is called vanadium dioxide. And so to remind you of your periodic table, uh, vanadium dioxide is a vanadium atom with two oxygen atoms. And so this material has the special property of having a very large index contrast, 
that we can access through the application of a voltage or actually also shining a laser light on it. The other thing is it transitions very quickly. So it not only has a large index contrast, but it has a very fast response that can enable our terahertz switching speeds. So just to show you a little bit of experimental data from the lab, we have a setup where this particular ring resonator is shown right here. And we've, this is an infrared camera image of the waveguide. So light is traveling down the waveguide. And in this configuration, it's going to stay trapped in the ring. You get a little bit of scattering here. So that's OK. Uh, and so it stays trapped in the ring. So if we look at the output, this is a 0. There's no light coming out. If we now uh, apply a voltage or we hit it with a, a very fast laser beam, uh, we can notice that we can change it now to a 1. So it goes from a 0 to a 1 when we apply a voltage or we hit it with a laser beam. So we haven't quite achieved the terahertz. Uh, we're heading that way. That's why it's research. We're working on it. Um, it's very exciting work. Uh, and I'm happy to go into more scientific detail. Uh, but again, I advertised at the beginning for general audiences. So please feel free to ask questions uh, afterwards if you, if you want me to know more details about this particular project. I will say that we're not the only ones, certainly not the only ones, looking at optics and computing. Intel and IBM, two of the major industrial players uh, in the computing industry, are also having significant research devoted to trying to integrate light into computers. And so within the last year, both IBM and Intel have come out with visions and actual um, devices that they fabricated on their traditional foundry CMOS lines that produce the computers that we've all bought. Uh, and they've integrated optical components. They've integrated waveguides. Uh, and they've integrated optical switches uh, with their standard processing. So the key here is not just advanced performance, but for it to make it to the market and have an impact on our lives, it has to be cost effective. And so the fact that these companies can actually produce optical components using the same existing fabrication lines that they use for the traditional electronics is very promising for us to see these kind of components uh, in the not too distant future. The projections are first optical components will land in things like supercomputers, servers, uh, and eventually perhaps in the PCs uh, or Macs uh, that we, we all use. OK, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about the second application of what light can do for us. So we talked about light for computing. And I want to talk about how light can actually help us with things like disease diagnostics, uh, environmental monitoring, food safety, uh, as well as uh, making sure that there's no toxins uh, that are in the air. And I'll talk about three different ways that light can help us. To ease us into this gradually, I thought I'd start with first the same ring resonator platform we just talked about for computers and show you how that can be used for sensing the presence of particular chemical or biological molecules. Then we'll talk about how light reflecting off a surface can also tell you something about the presence and identity of molecules. And finally, we'll end with the more sophisticated method that light can do this, something called Raman scattering. And the why is higher sensitivity of detection. If you're thinking about detecting diseases, you want to catch it as early as possible. So if there's a disease that's just starting in your body, you might only have a few markers that suggest that you have this disease. With current diagnostics, you might not be able to detect the presence of that disease until it evolves uh, and becomes harder to treat. So with some of the optical approaches, you may be able to detect the presence of these few molecules much earlier. Similar things uh, would hold for the other applications that I mentioned. Secondly, uh, cost effective. A lot of the techniques with light are fairly simple and straightforward. So there's a, a goal. Um, for those who are Star Trek fans, the tricorder, we're still working towards that. Um, but I think realistically within our lifetimes, we will see diagnostic applications that can be integrated in cell phone technology, where you can use light integrating with, for example, a finger prick of blood, put it on a cassette, put it in your cell phone. There'll be a laser diode integrated in your cell phone. It can probe the sample. It'll uh, detect the presence of the molecules. Perhaps it'll use wireless connection to compare to a database and come back and tell you whether or not you have that particular disease. So these are the kind of things that we're pretty excited about. So we'll start with the first one. This is, again, the same ring resonator that we just talked about for optical computing. And now we're going to use the same platform for biosensing and for detecting diseases or food pathogens or environmental hazards. So instead of applying a voltage to change from ones and zeros, we're going to use the molecules as the substitute for our voltage. And so the idea is as follows. You have light coming in to the straight wave guide, and it has the option of coupling into the ring or coupling out of the straight wave guide. Again, the idea of zeros and ones. So 
in a particular situation, if you have initially a condition where you have light trapped in the ring and then you add molecules, you can change from an initial state of zero to one. So the presence of the molecules could allow light to transition from staying trapped in the ring to propagating in the waveguide. How do we determine which molecules are trapped? You could say, well, no matter what lands on your ring, it's going to give you a change from a zero and a one. So here's where we have to borrow from our friends, the chemists. It turns out with biology, a lot of molecules are what you could consider a lock and a key. So that you have certain surface terminations on your molecules that are very specific to that molecule. And so if you put a complement on your sensor, your sensor will only detect the molecule you're looking for as they come together as a lock and a key. So the chemistry allows you to select which molecules are allowed to stick to the surface. And then the optics tells you whether or not those molecules are present on the surface. So for many applications, we want to have something beyond a yes, no. We want to quantify it. Is this number of molecules beyond a level that's going to be hazardous to our health? And so how do we do this? It turns out that we, instead of using just a single color of light, a laser light, we shine several wavelengths of light. So if we look at this is an optical transmission spectrum of we put a little detector here and we monitor the intensity of light coming. So if we look at the laser light example, we would fix our wavelength. So at a particular wavelength, the black, let's assume there was no molecules present, so we had very low transmission. When we added molecules, our signal went up to the red level, so it went up to a 1. So what we looked at previously was just staying on one wavelength, transferring between a 1 and a 0. But if you measure several wavelengths, you can then figure out what's the new wavelength that satisfies the criterion of optical path length must be integer multiple of the wavelength. And so by doing so, here we found the new wavelength that satisfies the criterion. And if we look at what is the wavelength difference between no molecules and molecules, we can actually quantify how many molecules are present. And so the more molecules you add to the surface, the more shift you have in your spectrum and you can quantify this. Are you with me? Excellent. OK, so moving on to example number two. And I'll start with something that we've all seen. This is going to explain how light and reflectance can tell us whether or not particular molecules or chemicals are there. So we'll start by thinking about oil that may drip out of your car and on the driveway or soap bubbles. These always have multiple colors. And I don't know if you ever wondered or if you know why there's all these colors that are present. These are both very thin films. And it turns out that if you study it, they have a gradient in their thickness. They're not equal thickness. One end is going to be thinner. One end is thicker. And so if you come in with sunlight, sunlight having all the colors of the rainbow present, based on the thickness of your film, it will select which color preferentially gets reflected. So here it's showing for the thinner ones, you get red, and then yellow, green, and then purple for the thicker ones. So this suggests that by looking at the color of the reflected light, we know something about the thickness of the film. And again, this only works for th films that are very thin uh, compared to the wavelength of light. So how can we use this for sensing? So let's imagine we have a sensor that consists of a uniform thickness thin film. And we have our sunlight or our white light coming in. It will reflect only one color of light because we only have one thickness. Well, now let's imagine we trap some molecules on the surface, again, using our special chemistry to select which molecule we want to capture. What's going to happen to the reflected light? Is it going to be red? That's right. Oh, oh, uh, we might have to go to the democracy. <laughs> How many people think it will remain red when we have molecules added? Raise your hand. How many think it will not be red? Thankfully, the democracy is correct. Uh, and indeed, the color will change. So effectively, what we've done is when you add molecules, you've made this film thicker. So it's the same as what we did here with the oil film. As you went from a thinner part to a thicker part, a different color was reflected from the surface. So again, the chemistry will tell you which molecule it is. But the light will tell you that that particular molecule is indeed captured on your sensor surface. If you want to quantify how many molecules, you can do the same trick that we played with the ring resonator. You can actually send in uh, and measure 
uh, all the different colors of light. So wavelength, again, is the colors of light. And it turns out, if you look at the red color here, it might be this red fringe pattern. That's characteristic of red. And if you have the blue light reflected, it might be this blue fringe pattern here, which is shifted. And so again, if you measure this shift, you can tell how many molecules are present. So again, it's a simple concept. OK, let me jump back here. What we want to do, again, at Vanderbilt is make things better. So with a finite surface area available, you can only capture a finite number of molecules. Otherwise, you just have no more area for molecules to uh, bind to. If you have very, very small molecules, sometimes it's difficult to be able to perceive the color change because it might be too small to measure. And so what we're doing is increasing the surface area so we can allow more molecules to bind. So again, I have an example that hopefully uh, will give you some intuition. The sensors that we were just talking about are what I would classify as planar sensors, flat surfaces, molecules can bind on the outside. And so if we just consider one that happens to be a cube, three centimeters on a side, that has a surface area of a golf ball. That's, for those keeping track, about 54 centimeters squared. If instead we take the same cube and now we introduce nanoscale holes, very, very tiny holes, smaller than that fiber uh, that I passed around earlier, you can wrap up an entire football field in the size of the golf ball. So this allows you to capture many, many more molecules than you could otherwise. So another example of nanotechnology is good. Um, and the footprint of these holes, again, is going to be about a million times smaller than the golf ball. So you can't see them, uh, but they are there. And as long as the molecules are smaller than the holes, the molecules can go inside the material and give you a much brighter color change than you would see on a flat surface. Just to remind you of size scales, this is what I talked about before. This is an analogy that I like to give macro scale to nano scale. So on the top, we have our macro scale example. We go from the Bat Building, downtown Nashville. This is about uh, 200,000 millimeters tall. You go down a couple orders of magnitude. Here's LeBron James. Old photo, we know he's still not in Cleveland. Uh, but he's about uh, 2,000 millimeters high. Go down another couple of orders of magnitude, size of a quarter. This is about 20 millimeters. And go down one more order of magnitude, and we have a pinhead. If now we move to the nanoscale, the equivalent of the bat building is going to be the width of your hair. So that's something you kind of have a sense of what it is. So going from the Bat Building to imagining LeBron James standing here at the bottom of the Bat Building is the same as having a red blood cell up against your human hair. So red blood cells are much, much smaller than your hair. What we're interested in detecting for diseases, pathogens, food safety, et cetera, are things like viruses and DNA. So to compare the size of a quarter sitting on the sidewalk next to the Bat Building is the same as a virus sitting next to your hair. Very, very small things. DNA is even smaller. DNA is like this little tiny pin sitting next to the bat building. That's DNA compared to the size of your hair. So nanoscale is very, very small. And the size of the holes that we're talking about to capture these are on the size scale of the virus. So these are our quarters sitting next to the bat building. These are very, very small things. OK. So this is some of the examples of the research that we're doing here at Vanderbilt. This is a material that's silicon, the same material we were talking about for computing, and now we're going to use it for sensing. So through a chemical means, we introduce these very, very tiny holes, these nanoscale holes. Again, these are our pinheads compared to the bat building. Uh, and it's like a sponge. So this is your kitchen sponge shrunk down about 100,000 times. <clears throat> and in the crop section, you have uh, these holes that can uh, propagate, and you can actually do very interesting things with them by changing the density of holes as a function of depth in the material. And that changes the way the optics work. And again, this is something that I can talk about at length afterwards, but we're keeping this for, for general audiences only. And so the end product is what you see here. So the silver region here is just crystalline silicon wafer. The colored region is our porous silicon film. So this is the same thing like the oil slick or the soap bubbles, but it's a mostly uniform thickness. So we can quickly tell in the lab how uniform our thickness is based on the color gradients. You can see it's pretty good, but we have a little bit of a different thickness here in this ring. 
when we introduce molecules, and in this case, it's a very simple example of dropping water molecules uh, on it, you see a very distinct color change. So if you were to introduce something like DNA, and we do that in my lab for genomics uh, and other uh, medical applications, you would not see such a bright color change, but it is one that's measurable by standard instrumentation in the lab. And so just in case you didn't believe me, I did bring the sample along. And if we can get our document cam to work. Uh, if this works. It's hard to see the color. If not, you're welcome to come up afterwards and have a look. Let's see if this will introduce some color that's visible on the screen. Yep. So it's a little bit hard to see on the camera. Uh, but if you come up afterwards, it's a very distinctive color change uh, that you can observe. And if this may or may not evaporate in time. But I've left it so you can see some of it has the water with one color and some of it doesn't have the water with the other color. Okay, so we've got one more to go. And I said I've saved the most complicated for last. So this is called Raman scattering. What we had talked about before is having white light sunlight, multiple colors of light incident on a surface, and it selectively reflects one of those colors. Now we're going to change over and just have a laser. So just like this laser pointer, it only has one color. So on its reflection, you would expect there to be the same color coming out. Just if I shine it on the whiteboard, there's going to be a reflection coming into somebody's eye. Sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> and you'd expect to have the same color. Now, this idea of Raman scattering is that actually one out of one million photons of light is not going to be red. It's going to go through a process called inelastic scattering. It's going to lose some of its energy, and it's going to change its color. And so the Raman scattered photons will have a different color than your incident laser light. And the really special property about this is the Raman scattered photon actually has knowledge of the chemical material that it interacts with. So I have an example of a sensor surface with some molecules on it. And based on the chemical bonds in this molecule, it will determine the color of the light that's scattered. So it's a very sensitive technique that can identify the molecule. Here we don't need special um, chemistry to selectively attach the molecules. This will, no matter what molecule you put down, it'll have a signature that you can detect. The problem is only one out of a million photons has this special property. So it's pretty hard to detect. This is an example of the kind of spectrum that you would see. So you can just imagine this bottom axis is like color. So you have different intensities at different colors. And these are signatures. So these are various drugs, uh, caffeine, aspirin, and some others. And you can see that they each have a distinctive pattern. And this technique is called molecular fingerprinting, because we can identify the molecule based on these special Raman scattered photons. So what we're doing here at Vanderbilt is to try to figure out how we can get more photons to have this special property so we don't need such sophisticated instruments to be able to measure these kind of signals. And so several people are working on this problem. The simplest way is actually just to use a roughened metal surface. Uh, what we're doing is, again, using nanotechnology. So we use a material called nanoporous gold. It's gold with very small nanoscale pores. And we imprint the special periodic pattern into it. And again, Broad audiences, I won't go into the details, but I'm happy to discuss how exactly it works. But I'll just show you the results that we see in our lab. So this is a particular molecule called benzene thiol that we're using as an example molecule to try to detect. The blue spectrum here is for a surface that really doesn't amplify our signal at all. We're not getting very many of these special photons out. The red one is a substrate called clarite that you can buy commercially. $70 for each substrate, not reusable not very cost effective. 
but it allows you to see the chemical signature of the benzene thiol. What we're doing here at Vanderbilt is this top curve. So this special nanoporous gold gives us about an order, one to two orders of magnitude stronger signal than what you can buy commercially on the market. The really nice thing about this is you could almost make this at home yourself. So what we do is we start by going to the arts and crafts store and buying some white gold leaf. So this costs about five cents per centimeter squared, pretty cheap. What we then do is, if you're doing this at home, please be careful, you need a little nitric acid. So you have to put your white gold leaf in a beaker of nitric acid. And what happens is that the gold leaf has uh, both gold and silver. And so the nitric acid selectively eats away the silver. And where the silver inclusions were now become air. So you're left with this nanoporous gold. So after a quick soak in nitrous acid, you actually have a nanoscale porous material, again, from your local art store. The next part is I said we had that special periodic pattern in it. This is also fairly simple to do. This is just a stamping technique. So you make a stamp out of silicon. Now this you can't do at home in your garage, but I can provide you one, or there's places you can buy these. Uh, but once you have one, you simply press it into your porous material and release. And then you can reuse it. And so you can stamp out all of these patterns. And I have another image of what it looks like. And this is the macro scale image. So we put it on a silicon wafer just for support. This upper region is the porous gold. And the color region here is where we've imprinted this periodic pattern. So it's a really simple, cost effective, and very uh, highly efficient technique for identifying molecules. So this is something we're pretty uh, excited about and working on. OK, we've come to the end. The big message, the take home message is light is more than illumination. So now when you think of light, don't just think about your room lights. Don't just think about the sun. Think about light as a means of carrying information and manipulating data. And so the three examples we specifically talked about, again, were fibers, computers, and detection of chemical and biological molecules. So while I was up here presenting the work, I certainly did not do all of this work. Um, a lot of the research that I presented uh, was funded by several federal agencies. Several people at Vanderbilt in physics, chemical engineering, chemistry contributed to the work. Uh, this is my, my group of graduate students. Uh, and I'd like to highlight especially Gilbert uh, and Peter, who helped put together some of the slides today. Um, this is the end of the presentation. I'm happy to answer your questions. And I thank you for your attention. And again, enjoy the commencement festivities. It's been known for quite some time. There was a seminal paper that came out in the 80s. It's known generally as the electro-optic effect. And how you can think of it is when you apply electricity, electricity has electrons, which are charge carriers. And introducing these charge carriers directly impacts the refractive index. So there's equations describing the more charge carriers you put into a material, how much it affects the refractive index of the material. And it's material dependent. So applying a fixed amount of voltage or electricity to a given material will change it a certain amount. But that same amount of electricity or voltage to another material will change it a different amount. That's when it became well known in silicon and started to be utilized for these things of um, electro-optic switching. Being at a university, in this case, is much nicer than being at industry. If you have an idea at industry and it gets patented, you get a pat on the back, maybe a dollar bill and a plaque on the wall. At Vanderbilt, the process is that if we have an idea that we think may have some potential commercial value, we have a very good technology transfer office. We speak with people. They do a market survey to see if they think that the research may lead to something that has value. Uh, and a patent can be submitted. The breakdown is that Vanderbilt will own the IP, but they will share any royalties, any licensing fees with the inventors. So 
a large fraction goes, well, it's about half and half of what goes to the university and what goes to the inventors. And so amongst the technologies that I talked about, the porous silicon sensors, those um, special nanoporous gold sensors, those are all things that we have patents that are pending on. So this is also a very interesting question. So inventor has a legal definition on who contributed the scientific innovation, the ideas, but Vanderbilt has a broader view in who can share in any revenue that's generated. So the legal team will determine who are the inventors, who actually came up with the ideas. But in the course of the four years or so that it takes to go through the patent process, that research is evolving and developing. And you may have somebody who makes a critical contribution to that work that makes it a lot more marketable, but they are not a primary and initial inventor. So Vanderbilt will still allow you to reward them for their contribution towards the development. Um, and it's, this is something that I happen to be on the tech transfer committee, so I know something about. Um, but it's great to be at a university. They are really promoting not just generating patents, but actually having uh, the development and the licensing of ideas that can help society. That's an excellent question, and it's a technical detail. So as you said, most of the light is confined within that waveguide. But if you look at the distribution, there is a little bit of light that leaks out the side. And so there are certain, uh, let's call it momentum matching conditions. So the description of how you define the light that's on the outside um, supported outside the straight waveguide and what could be supported on the outside of the ring waveguide, if those match exactly, then you can actually have the light essentially leap from one waveguide to the next. And it's very dependent on the distance. So if you're too far apart, there's no way to go from one to the other. And similarly, if you're too close together, it's too easy once you go in to go back out. So there's a critical distance that you have to have. The, the problem there is if you want to create a zero, you have to have light continuing to circulate in that ring. And if it's too close, it actually couples back out. So maybe after one round trip, it comes back out. And you need it to stay there for some duration of time until you switch again back to the one. Uh, these principles absolutely apply to outside of the visible spectrum. So in fact, um, the ring resonator work that I showed you, the camera image, that was in the infrared. Uh, the losses in silicon are a little bit less as you go to longer wavelengths in the infrared. The processes are the same. The thickness values change, so they scale with the wavelength. So confining light in a waveguide that's visible light, your waveguide's smaller because visible light has a shorter wavelength than infrared light. But the principles definitely hold to other wavelength regimes. Correct. You have to consider the absorption properties of the material. If it's, the material is opaque, then obviously you can't transmit light through it. Yep. There was a question up in the back. Sure. Yeah, LEDs, uh, there's actually um, a good body of research that's being done at Vanderbilt for white light LEDs. Uh, so for room lighting like this, when we think about replacing our favorite incandescent bulbs with fluorescent bulbs, which are already in the room, they're a little bit harsh lighting, LEDs hold the promise of giving you better color quality. So for those who've seen LED flashlights, or if you have LED flashlights, they tend to be kind of bluish white. Those are made by having a blue colored light emitting diode and putting a yellow phosphor on top of it. So you really have blue plus yellow equals white. But if you want a pure white, you need some red as well. You need a balanced spectrum. And so people here at Vanderbilt are working on a material called cadmium selenide that is a nanomaterial that itself actually emits white light. 
and they're working towards incorporating that into LEDs. So the LEDs that are commercially available are getting better. Their color quality still isn't as good as the sun or as an incandescent bulb, but they're getting better. And LEDs are certainly colored. Single color LEDs are really very prevalent, uh, very well established. Um, and on the research end, you're doing things more like uh, how can you integrate them into other technologies, maybe lower the threshold current values, power values. Uh, but the white light LED is really the one that people are pushing in the research arena. Is that the one that also So the answer is it depends on how long a distance you want to propagate your information. So if you look at light coming out of an LED versus light coming out of a laser pointer like this, the laser pointer is highly directional, it has higher power, and so for longer distance communication, you really need a laser. But if you're shorter distance communication, the power levels and the LED that has a little bit of dispersion broadening is still okay if the distance is not too great. Um, but right now, people can make laser diodes that are very cost effective. Uh, so most of what you're going to see is laser-based, um, not LED-based, for the optical computing. If you're doing the biosensing, LEDs may be uh, a viable option. Uh, you talked about how on a uh, fiber optic cable, what limits the number of frequencies? It's basically, as was suggested here, the material properties. So there's only a certain range of colors that are transparent for the material. At some point, you're going to reach a color that's opaque. And so basically, if you shine a particular color on the fiber, it's just going to get absorbed. And so the limit is within that bandwidth that you can possibly transmit, how finely can you chop it up? And that depends on your detectors and the bandwidth of the detector. But the current state of the technology is less than one nanometer separation between colors. So you definitely cannot perceive that by eye. It's a very, very fine. One nanometer, it's less than one nanometer wavelength separation. Yeah. With the silicon ring resonator, that's called vanadium dioxide, VO2. It currently is widely available. Um, I don't know what the worldwide resource is. So for example, if this is the new material that's in everybody's computers, I don't know if there will be a material shortage. It's not one that's highlighted uh, as um, uh, a non-abundant material. Things like um, indium for indium tin oxide that is used in a lot of electronics is flagged as this is a material of concern. Um, but I think vanadium dioxide has not been used to an extent where we've reach that concern. So I actually don't know the perfect answer to your question, but I'm not aware of any immediate concerns. Any final questions? Yes, one more. Uh, the uh, Rossman scanner, mm -hmm. I assume you're probably testing a very pure chemical or whatever. In a real world setting where you have all sorts of crap in the sample, how would you do to pick out the signals you're looking for? Or does this is a really great question. So we've started some discussions, and then we had a visit to one of the Army research uh, facilities that is very interested in explosives and toxin detection. And they've done a lot of experiments. And what they've said is you, if you have a sample that's completely unpurified, the signal potentially can be so complex and so convoluted that it is hard to find the needle in the haystack. So what people traditionally do is actually put some selective chemical on the surface to allow you to downselect. So not everything can stick, but still more than just the one molecule can stick. So you can have a family of molecules that still would be allowed to stick. And then it becomes easier to do a little simple signal processing and identify which molecules are there. But you're absolutely right. If you let everything bind and you have a very dirty sample, it becomes very difficult to identify. How unique So conceptually, the ideas that I talked about are going on at multiple locations, universities, industry, national labs. The specific examples when we talked about the nanopore silicon, the nanopore's gold that we pattern, there you're talking about a few people in the world who are doing that, and nobody's doing exactly what we're doing.
This is a, a very timely topic. I, I actually, I was in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday uh, doing some advocating for basic research funding. Um, and I met with several congressional staffers representing Tennessee senators uh, and, and House of uh, Representatives. And everybody uniformly is for encouraging further education in science and technology, for additional funding for basic research, and then, oh, by the way, we have budget cuts, so we're going to do the best we can. It's a small piece of the pie and one that everybody would like to protect as much as possible. Um, but that's politics. That's beyond my pay grade. Thanks for your attention. Again, if you have any further questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer them.